dear brothers and sisters in Christ, from the pillars of orthodoxy, our holy fathers, Saints Gregory Palamas and Mark of Ephesus, they discuss the dangers of the pan heresy of ecumenism. Our Holy Father, Gregory of Thessaloniki, lived under the rule of Andronicus II, Paleologos, around the year 1340. Having left the world and everything in it, and immigrated from Constantinople, his home, to the holy mountain of Athos, he embraced, embraced the monastic life. There he engaged in the toils of the greatest asceticism and the highest hezekiah, with his soul turned only towards God, and he became the most godlike mirror of the Holy Spirit, being raised, as few ever were, to the summit of Praxis and Theoria. There, irradiated in his intellect by the contemplative splendors of the Spirit, he left to the Church of God most wise and most theological writings as a memorial of orthodoxy. The subtle serpent and source of vice once again rears his own head against us. He whispers things opposite to the truth. Further, seeing as he indeed had his head crushed by the cross of Christ, he makes those who obey his destructive counsels in every generation each take the place of his own head. And so, like the hydra, he has sprouted many heads instead of the one. He relentlessly speaks utter unrighteousness through them. So he did with the Arians, so with the Apollinarians, so with the Enomians and Macedonians, and he has thus attached to himself, to his coiled body, the host of others who have clung to him. The wicked one, always feeding off of serpentine and earthly wickedness, the vigilant stalker, tirelessly looking out for the heel, that is to say, deceit, the sophist, most resourceful and immensely ingenuous, in every opinion noxious to God, not having at all forgotten his own evil art, introduces innovative expressions concerning God through the Latins which hearken to him. While these innovations seem to make but a small change, yet they create the occasion for many evils, and bring in many things that are subtle, foreign to piety, and logically absurd. He thus clearly displayed to all, in doing this, that even the smallest thing is not small in matters concerning God. But you, he says, addressing the Latins, why do you say there are two origins for the divinity? For what does it matter if you do not plainly say this but if it is deduced from what you are saying? Such things are the depths of Satan, the mysteries of the evil one, which he whispers to those who lend their ears to him. He whispers not in the sense of softening or lowering the tone of his voice, but rather by concealing the intended harm. For my part, I believe this is how he also whispered to Eve. But, since we have been taught by the divine wisdom of the fathers that we should not be ignorant of his devices, which are at first on the whole invisible to the many, we would never at any time receive you into communion, as long as you say that the Spirit is also from the Son. Now the Latins, 
Oh, the simultaneous senselessness and madness. They actually despise the reverent and confessed order in God. And those things which Basil the Great and Gregory the Theologian confess to be beyond their own knowledge, as being ineffable and transcending us, these things the Latins boast that they understand. But they innovate regarding the inexpressible and incomprehensible procession of the Holy Spirit. Or, to speak more bluntly, they blaspheme when they say that the procession is both indirect and direct, both proximate and far, by which they risk degrading the Holy Spirit into a creature. Since the Latins say the one is from the two in the same respect in which the origin and the cause also are both thought and said, and these are the three hypostases, and so the three persons of the divinity, one in nature, they say the one is from two origins, and introduce two origins and two causes, and thus polytheism. For God is one, not only because there is one nature, but also because one person possesses the anaphoral return of those which are from him, and those from the origin return to one cause and one origin, those from the origin being not only both of the two, but also each one of them separately. So, to fall away from what is right was something common to all the churches, as evil laid waste sometimes to the one, sometimes to another, through the length of time. But that a fallen one no longer return, this only occurred with the church of the Latins. Even though she is both the largest and chief and possessing the most eminent summit of the patriarchal thrones. The same thing befell her, who is the greatest of the churches that befell the elephant, which is the greatest of the animals. They say that it does not lay itself down on the ground for rest even during sleep, but it rests a while by crouching for a little time on its sides, and if it were to suffer something and fall down, it is no longer able to get itself up again. But for the elephants, the cause is actually the weight of the body and the sheer enormity of their flesh, which is cumbersome and weighs them down, just like an overlying piece of lead weighing many talents. In contrast, with the Latins I gather that it is only pride, I would almost say an incurable passion which, according to the Apostle, is also most peculiarly, particularly, the crime belonging to the only evil one, which is the reason why that one is forever incurable. But should this tribe of Latins push him back, they are able, since indeed they are human, immediately all we of the bright mindset gathered together into one, using as it were some sort of trunks, which nature has also provided as a help from the elephants that are not lying down for those that have fallen. Thus, having used the God-inspired oracles, we would raise them up and set them standing on their feet and unswervingly maintaining the rule of piety. Yet, those who willingly lay themselves down will not profit at all, even if the remedy for pseudodoxy were to be prepared and administered by the celestial intellects themselves. For theirs is the saying that has been expressed by the prophetic words, We have healed Babylon, but she was not healed.
to preface the address of Saint Mark of Ephesus, that pillar of the Church, given on the day of his death regarding the pan heresy of ecumenism, we read from the Synaxarian of the life of Saint Mark of Ephesus, who is commemorated on January the 19th. The great teacher and invincible defender of the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, Saint Mark, was the offspring of Sion, the imperial city, Constantinople. Reared by pious parents and instructed in secular and spiritual wisdom, he became preeminent in both. Saint Mark lived as an ascetic on the Prince's Islands and later in the monastery of Saint George Mangana in Constantinople. He passed through all the degrees of the priesthood and was finally advanced to the dignity of Archbishop and the lofty throne of the metropolis of Ephesus. At the insistence of Emperor John Palliod Palaeologos, the saint was sent to the Council of the Latins in Florence to unite the churches that had been divided for so many years. He astounded the papal teachers with the divine wisdom of his words, and was the only one who did not sign the blasphemous decree of that false council. Because of this, the Holy Church of Christ has ever honored this great man as a benefactor, teacher, sole defender, and invincible champion of the Apostolic Confession. He reposed in the year 1443. The Address of Saint Mark of Ephesus on the Day of His Death They who have accepted the union with the Papists have dishonored and corrupted the Church by making her mingle with those putrid members that have been cut off from her for many years and are subject to countless anathemas, and through communion with them they have besmirched the spotless Bride of Christ. Regarding those who had accepted union with the Papists, St. Mark of Ephesus says this, Concerning the Patriarch, I shall say this, lest it should perhaps occur to him to show me a certain respect at the burial of this my body, or to send my grave, to my grave, any of his hierarchs or clergy, or in general any of those in communion with him, in order to take part in prayer, or to join the priest invited to it from amongst us, thinking that at some time, or perhaps secretly, I had allowed communion with him. And lest my silence give occasion to those who do not know my views well and fully to suspect some kind of conciliation, I hereby state and testify before the many worthy men here present that I do not desire in any manner and absolutely and do not accept communion with him or with those who are with him, not in this life nor after my death, just as I accept neither the union nor Latin dogmas which he and his adherents have accepted and for the enforcement of which he has, he has occupied this presiding place, with the aim of overturning the true dogmas of the Church. I am absolutely convinced that the farther I stand from him and those like him, the nearer I am to God and all the saints, and to the degree that I separate myself from them, am I in union with the truth and with, with the Holy Fathers, the theologians of the Church, and I am likewise convinced that those who count themselves with them stand far away from the truth and from the blessed teachers of the Church. And for this reason I say, just as in the course of my whole life I was separated from them, 
So at the time of my departure, ye, and after my death, I turn away from intercourse and communion with them, and I vow and command that none of them shall approach either my burial or my grave, and likewise anyone else from our side, with the aim of attempting to join and concelebrate in our divine services. For this would be to mix what cannot be mixed, but it befits them to be absolutely separated from us until such time as God shall grant correction and peace to his church. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Saints Gregory Palamas and Mark of Ephesus, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us.